Australia Pacific Aerospace Consultants, or APAC. So we've got uh, Bill Barrett is the Senior Vice President of APAC, lo located in Sydney, Australia, and he has over 25 years of experience in the space and telecommunication industries, and has held numerous senior positions, including in commercial management, marketing, and business development. And we've also got Kirby Eichen, who is the Managing Director of Asia Pacific Aerospace Consultants. I'll hand over to these guys. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to shift gears. We've had, one of the things that Donna and Elias have, have sort of talked about, and Todd, is, uh, Mark as well, have talked about this morning, is how unique space is. This is not a normal business environment. And so what we're going to talk about today is some of the unique features that you need to think about if you're actually going to start a business in space. So just a little bit about APAC's background. We're a city-based consulting firm specializing in space and telecommunications. We're probably best known more recently for all the work we've done for the Australian government to characterize the Australian space industry. Major studies that we did on that in 2010, 2011, and the latest in 2016. Um, but more interesting for this group, we've been involved in the formation and early stage development of numerous space businesses. And one of our core services is actually advising on the interface between technology and business. How do you actually bring high tech into a business environment? How do you make a buck? So the other thing we'll talk about, we are um, experts in space insurance. Um, we were, um, Kirby was managing director of GIO Space, which generated $175 million per annum in the 90s. Uh, we were um, one of the top 10 space insurers in the world. Sadly, AMP, when they acquired GIO, thought that was not a good business and, and <laughs> literally shut it down. So for, there were extensive circumstances with that. Just a bit about the background. I mean, many people just do not know the extent of uh, international connections that this guy has. He is the global chairman of the National Space Society based in Washington, D.C. And one of his claims to fame is that he took over from Buzz Aldrin as the chairman of that organization, uh, which always raises a lot of interesting discussions when, when he tells that in the pub. So he's also a co-founder of Deep Space Industries. And he's, as I said a moment ago, he's former managing director of GIO Space, which at one level, you could call a startup because it started in 1985 with when OSAT was first launched. Um, they decided, well, there should be some Australian component to this in space insurance. Now, Kirby wasn't quite there at that time, but when he came on board, he grew the organization to that $175 million figure and top 10 in the world. So uh, at one level, that is a bit of a space startup in, in, a, in a different guise. With myself, um, I've got a long background. I started building commercial satellites for Hughes Aircraft, so I've been involved in satellite manufacture. Was hired down here to win the Intelsat ground tracking station and the TT and TCC and M sites for uh, for the old OTC. I've provided. I've worked in satellite services, selling uh, services on communication satellites. Both Kirby and I were involved in the Asia Pacific Space Center, trying to build a spaceport on Christmas Island with. Um, the Soyuz technology, the Russian technology. So we were the first ones to try and get a space <coughs> license under the Space Activities Act. We've got the scars to, to prove it. Um, and, you know, just a, I've also been involved in the insurance and regulatory side. So we have a wide a range of business attributes. One of the things that it was interesting talking to a client recently. Uh, about all the different ventures that we've been involved in. So I sat down and actually looked at it. I, I personally, and Kirby as well, have been in, involved in 30 plus startups or new ventures in the space um, industry. So, well, for in my case, space and telecommunications, I've done some, some of those as well. So we, we have some experience in this realm. One of the things I wanted to um, just briefly cover today the uniqueness of the space industry, but how you can actually use business and um, business structures and insurance um, and financial structures to actually move your business along. It might be particularly interesting to startups to understand that. So 
we'll cover a few things. But um, one of the things, though, people have talked about this morning, space is somewhat unique. And we, I want to touch briefly on some of those for anybody looking to start a business in this field. You do need to consider things. And one is the regulations. We've heard a lot about the, the issues with um, the liability side of things. Uh, with the New Space Activities Act and the existing act. Um, there's a couple of things that I do want to mention with that. One, though, about insurance. One thing you need to think about, especially when it comes to authorizations where maybe you skate around those rules. If you're a business, what are your financiers going to think about uncapped liability? I'm not sure that's a discussion you really want to have with them. So as Donna pointed out, you may want insurance even if you're not obligated to have it because it provides surety and comfort for those investors that you've managed to, to snare and back your business. One of the things that Mark Todd did not quite mention this morning, um, one of the new things with the Act, the, the, the new legislation, is that they are going to put something in about a requirement for a space debris mitigation strategy. And this gets back to the issue with what we're dealing with in space. The two things I'm going to talk about now are not just that they cover everybody who deals with um, putting something in space. Whether you're doing it as a business or as a university or as a, an amateur club. The problem is space is a common environment. And the issue of orbital debris, which is threatening and to some degree to stop activities in space is something we all have to be careful about. So one of the things that um, the new legislation includes is that every applicant will need to have a space debris mitigation strategy. Now in conversations with Mark in the department, we understand that that is actually going to be a reference primarily to the UN guidelines on space debris mitigation. So I just thought I would put these up here and just let everybody know this is coming, start thinking about it. The guidelines, there's seven. You need to limit debris released in normal operations. Now in the past, people would blow explosive bolts and, and the shrapnel and the shards of that would just float around in orbit. Well, actually people have found that they do impact um, solar cell arrays and things like that with, in some cases, catastrophic results. So, you need to make, ensure that when you go to space, this is, includes the um, separation of rocket stages as well as um, satellites that are placed in orbit, you limit the debris that's released in normal operations. You need to, as well, limit the or minimize the potential breakups during operations. So again, design your system in such a way that you're unlikely to have unwanted explosions. You need to limit the probability of collisions in orbit. That means you need to pick orbits that are not going to impinge on anybody else. So you need to do some orbital um, traffic management to understand that. You need to avoid intentional destruction. So, you know, if you're planning an experiment to just see um, how cool a, uh, an explosion might be in space, that's not going to be uh, um, accepted very well by the by the department in, when you apply for your application. One of the key ones is, is point number five, and I think that's, that's a, a really important one for everybody to realize. It's one that around the world everybody is starting to focus on now, and some jurisdictions are actually requiring this as part of the application process. You need to minimize the potential post-mission breakups due to stored energy. So that means you need to, at the end of your mission life, and you need to vent your fuel so that you no longer have stored energy that could explode. You need to um, um, also uh, discharge your electronic storage systems, your capacitors, your batteries, etc. The idea is to minimize explosion of the thing individually in space causing debris or an explosion that's triggered by collision with something else would, which would make it much worse. So that is one that certainly the United States is extremely uh, concerned about that particular one, and it's almost a requirement when they, um, for any new application. The other two, six and seven, is protecting the orbits. You need to limit the long-term presence of spacecraft and launch people stages in low Earth orbit, LEO, um, after you've finished your mission. 
Now, you know, many people are concerned about CubeSats because CubeSats, in their eyes, are orbital debris at launch because they generally don't have propulsion systems. So this is something, you know, you need to do what you can to minimize and clean the orbit as best as possible. Likewise, with uh, the geo orbits, you need to limit to the long-term interference of spacecraft and launch vehicle stages to the geo region. The geo operators all um, move their satellites after, um, after they're finished into a graveyard orbit, which is above geo. But rocket stages also, the uh, GTO transfer stages, you need to make sure that those are not going to impinge on that geo orbit. Moving to the next thing that people often don't think enough about is spectrum. <coughs> Again, this is a shared common. Everybody's using that same spectrum. There are limited bands available for um, space communications. And basically, it is every, in everybody's interest to make sure this is done, and this is policed to some degree. So all satellites need to, be need to have registered spectrum in order to operate. That basically is done by the International Telecommunication Union. Um, so you have to meet the international and Australian licensing coordination requirements. That is basically not to cause interference to anybody else who is up there. How do you, how do you share the spectrum without impinging on anybody else? So basically um, all space objects need to be registered through the ITU. So you end up getting a requirement through the ITU, but you as an individual here in Australia or an organization cannot go direct to the ITU you need to go through the ACMA, which is the Australian Communications Media Authority. They're the group that regulates that here in Australia. Um, and they will require technical details from you, including your orbit, <coughs> the frequencies you plan to use, the modulation schemes you're going to use, the power, uh, the output power of your systems. That will then get lodged with the ITU. The ITU then publishes the uh, advanced publication um, notice. <coughs> And then the C notice. Now, the API says, yes, this organization is planning to do that, and wants to use these frequencies. The C notice then is a call for coordination. So everybody else takes a look at that and says, is this going to impact me? Um, and then you need to front up with the ACMA to uh, say, to prove to those people who are existing operators or those who have orbital filings before you that you're not going to interfere with their service. Uh, there is a priority system, first come, first serve. So another question, get a uh, point, get in early. Um, the other thing, to operate in Australia, you need license from the, um, the ACMA to utilize spectrum within Australia. Now, there, I won't get into the details of that now, but there's two different ways you can do that. You can license the space segment, you can license the satellite itself, and if you do that in, in certain bands, you then have an automatic class license for the ground stations you're going to use to that. Conversely, you could just um, you could just license an Earth segment, uh, just a few ground stations to operate <coughs> with a space asset, asset. But since you have to go through the filing process with the ITU anyway, for most people, you're far better off trying to get the space license under the uh, IT under the ACMA rules. Now, another word to um, word to the a warning to the wise. <coughs> There are fees for use of, of spectrum. There are ITU fees and there are ACMA fees, so be prepared. Uh, it is a time-consuming process, so get started early. Now, I'll turn it over to Kirby to uh, take us through some of the business structures that we deal with in day-to-day in -day life in the space industry. Uh, and I'll use the microphone because like a lot of speakers, I've got a cold as well, so I apologize if I can't quite project. Um, <clears throat> So we've talked about some of the more regulatory facets. What I'd like to do is talk about some of the kind of pure business considerations. And I realize that a lot of people in this audience are here from an academic perspective or a technical perspective. But as more and more small companies and small businesses are emerging around CubeSat technology, I thought it's important that we, we look at some of these fundamental business issues. So structuring of a company is vitally important. It's very common that people start out with a company, shareholding, and then over time they bring in more and more investors and have different partners. And if you think about this early on and you structure things to have a separate operating company and a separate holding company, you can save yourself a lot of aggra aggravation further down the track. Um, and because we're very short of time, I'm going to skip through a lot of these things. But um, 
when you're dealing in an international arena, you do need to be aware of things like ITAR, uh, especially if you have US partners, your organisational structure might need to take um, account of that kind of issue. If we look at financing options, and, and one thing I realised this morning, I didn't have grants on this, but fundamentally for businesses, you, you can look at raising equity, people who will invest in your company and hope to get growth from um, that investment. You can have debt, and you don't get debt unless you have insurance in place because those debt providers uh, expect to get their money back whether you succeed or not. And then there is cash flow, and it's important to think about how you can use each of these. Now, space projects typically have had long time frames, and they often have a lot of capital uh, investment up front long before you get to getting returns from it. So typically with equity, you will start off with family and friends, people around you who can help you get your idea to a certain fundamental point. Then you'll probably get some seed investment, which might be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then you might move on to a series of different rounds of investment, because you, you don't want to give all of your company away at the beginning with, um, with taking on too much funding at that, at that point. Debt is important, because if you can get debt financing, it means you don't have to give away part of your company um, in return for those funds. Now, if you've got assets like equipment, so if you're building labs or you're building um, hardware, that may be an asset that you can actually borrow money against. And you can also borrow money using your personal assets. Now, that's not comfortable for a lot of people, but if you really believe in your business, you may be able to use your house as um, collateral to go out and get a loan to support your business. But one that a lot of people haven't thought about is cash flow and leasing concepts. I know there's at least one person in this room who has thought about the leasing concepts. Uh, but it's possible now to think about having a spacecraft that's built to your requirements, but instead of actually buying it with all of the capital requirement that goes with that, you have somebody else build it and they can finance it uh, if you then lease it. And so that may get your cost and capital requirements down to a much lower level possibly even just with um, cash flow itself. Contracting structures, this is very important, and I have seen some horrific examples where people do not adequately think through the risks that they're carrying. And one that I will touch on again, realising we are very short of time, I'd just like to touch on launch delay. I have seen a lot of startup companies, particularly where they've got a ride-sharing arrangement. Um, they are not a priority for the primary customer. The launch gets delayed and delayed and delayed, and I was so shocked to find that people had signed launch contracts that actually had no penalty clauses if their launch continually got delayed. And I know of at least two companies who are very, very close to going to the wall because they had enough money to go for a certain period of time, and progressively their launch kept delayed. So you must make sure that you've got yourself protected in your contracting arrangements. Now one of the key things that we wanted to talk about, those who were here last year would have seen some of this. Insurance is not just a necessary evil, but it's a financial tool that you can use to help get your business off the ground. There are lots of risks here, a lot of risks that customers will perceive. You're developing a new piece of technology, they're worried that it won't work or that it'll be delayed. They're worried that your launch will be delayed. So if you can use your insurance strategy to try to help take away that perception of risk for your customers, that might increase the probability of you signing a customer fairly early. And when you think about the insurance for your business, uh, you've really got to think about you're protecting what's going to happen to your business if something goes wrong. Don't think about insuring the satellite or insuring the launch vehicle or the cost of replacement. Because if your mission fails and you're running a business, it might take you another year or 18 months before you've actually got the replacements in place. You've got to keep your business running, you've got to keep paying your staff, you may run the risk of losing uh, the market that you are hoping to serve. Another thing that I'd just quickly like to point out here is that there are a whole lot of stakeholders involved in a space business. And it's not just your shareholders or your debt providers, but it's your customers because their business may depend on you getting your assets into place in time. And it's also the management and staff, the, the people who are working on this project. Something goes wrong, they want to know that they've still got a job and that the business will carry on moving forwards. 
the, one of the things we wanted to cover is that when we talk about insurance, we, there are actually many different types of insurance in the space industry. We've been focused on the liability side of that. That's, that's actually number eight on this list, which we've put in gold here, third party liability. But ultimately, you have satellite manufacturing and testing, transport of this satellite to the launch site, uh, integration and test at launch site. You've got your launch insurance itself, the in-orbit commissioning, the in-orbit operational phase, um, this, the decommissioning phase, perhaps, and one number nine, which Kirby was just talking about, business interruption insurance. So these are all financial tools that can help you get your business along and protect it in these various different stages of risk. So I think in the interests of time, we might, uh, well, I guess this just highlights some of the various facets that you've got to be thinking about when you're thinking about what exposures your business might have. And a classic one that a lot of people don't think about is the loss of markets to your rivals. Um, that may not be quite as important in the CubeSat market, but we actually have two uh, Australian startups here who are both in a similar marketplace with IoT. And so if one of those uh, suffers a failure of their spacecraft, the other doesn't, what does that potentially mean to their market? So I think we'll probably wrap it up, I think, at this point, given we're short on time. So the main thing here is you've got to think about all of these things very early. If you want a successful business, you need to address all of these things, and you are much better off addressing these right at the beginning rather than at the end when you suddenly have run out of money or you've run out of time and opportunity. So on that note, we'd uh, say thank you. So it's uh, time for morning tea now. I'd encourage you to catch up.